the big Bible, as that lady observed, the big fat Bible. The chair, no, the whole it's on the Bible. chair, the whole Bible, right, the whole Bible. And we're in Luke 15. I'm thinking when we finish Luke, we really ought to do Daniel. I was reading Daniel at breakfast, I will tell you. Very thrilling material. We should go back and do that again, I think. But Luke, for the moment, in the 15th chapter, let's see what we have here. I'm relying on your good comments, interaction out there, because there will be things that have affected your life, I'm sure, and you may want to tell us about some of that. But it's wonderful stuff. Jesus, the rabbi, and you'll find that the ordinary people were listening to him. The establishment was not so keen on Jesus, but the ordinary people were listening with great intent to what he had to say. 15.1, New American Standard, updated version. 15.1 goes like this. I'll Sarah on my right to do 15.2. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this story as an illustration. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? <coughs> when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. As soon as he gets oh, home, <laughs> as soon as he gets home, he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Come and celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. Yeah. In the same way, heaven will be happier over one lost sinner who returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And haven't strayed away. Yeah, the paraphrase is always interesting, helpful, loses a little bit of punch there by avoiding the word repentance. So, right. uh, verse 7, I tell you that in the same way, this is Rabbi Jesus speaking, recorded these 2,000 years ago, so there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent, please note. Doesn't mean they're sinless, but there's a basic repentance required of every human being. The righteous ones are not sinless, but they don't need to repent as in give up a whole lifestyle and start a brand new one. So I note this though, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Now, the tax collectors were notorious, you know, for being cheats. They were liable to take money for themselves. They were not popular. I won't make a parallel. You can imagine what sort of uh, career in contemporary America might be parallel, but you can think that up, I won't say. But there are some professions that are viewed as a little bit less honest than others, whatever that might be. But the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, who are the sinners? Well, the sinners. It seems so funny to me. What's that? Like, okay, let's put, I'm a sinner, I'm going to that group, <laughs> right. and I'm righteous, I'm right. going to be over here. I mean, that's just bizarre to me. Well, yes, but it's the way that Jesus is thinking. He's thinking very clearly in two groups. But the sinners notice, and my NSU margin is very helpful, says it means the irreligious Jews. That's right. These were Jews, sinners. It doesn't mean that they were all out there murdering and committing adultery and, and all of that, getting drunk. Not at all. It means they weren't practicing religion as known in Pharisees. And they might have been a lot smarter than the people who did, by the way. You see that? Jesus, please note, was up against the establishment. It's this, that's what drives him crazy. It's not the ordinary people who were listening to him. And they were sinners, not in the sense that they were out and out rogues in God's eyes. They were the irreligious Jews. And they might, in fact, have been better off being irreligious, right? So I, I mustn't get carried away here. But sometimes when I think that you can give a person a Bible and put him in a church and then he's going to put you in hellfire for having a glass of wine, you wonder if that has done him any good. So I won't go there because I, I shouldn't say such things like that, but think about it. Sometimes our tradition, I did go there anyway, and tradition then is a blight on religion, right? So sometimes atheism done well is better than religion done badly. That can happen. So, I so love the that. Pharisees would not put themselves in the sinners No, they would not. At all. However, I might put them in that category. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, Jesus, I think, did. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, he does that. I mean, we won't yeah. turn to the 23rd of Matthew, but he says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. He doesn't say, woe to you irreligious Jews, the common people. Yeah. 
It's the establishment that's the problem. It's not the ordinary folk. So those of us in the established religion in some way had better be extremely critical of ourselves to make sure we're not falling into the wrong category. So, who reacted in verse 2? The Pharisees and the scribes. The scribes were the professional Bible writers, commentators. The Pharisees were not all of them scribes. They, the Pharisees were not all doing religion or theology full-time. The scribes probably were. And the Pharisees then were certainly in charge of religious things without necessarily being full-time. But they were the establishment. And they began what? To grumble. They had a bad attitude. Not really did. They grumbled. Saying, this man, this awful fellow, this man is receiving sinners and actually having food with them. The sinners, remember, were the irreligious Jews. How dare he have a meal with some of these rogues out here, these people who don't even come to our church, right? You can see, as Michelle was pointing out, you can see the dichotomy between who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Then he tells them a parable. I love the way he does this. That was a very rabbinical thing to do. The rabbis told parables. They make their theological point with a nice comparison. What's a parable? It means throwing one thing against another. Paraboli in Greek means para, along with. Voli has to do with ball, throwing. You throw one idea against another and you compare them. So he says this then. Which man among you has a hundred sheep, lost one of them, does not leave the 99 uh, open pass and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. I'm not able to relate to that too much, but if you're a farmer, I'm sure you would. Uh, what would be a good modern comparison? Losing what? One of 99. Money, coins, whatever, you know, you've lost a coin under the sofa. <laughs> I don't know, anybody come up with a good analogy? I'm Contact sure. Lenses. What's that? Contact lenses. Contact lenses. We've searched long and hard with flashlight. Yes. What in England we call a torch. So I'm translating carefully for you. Flashlight. And to look for a lost contact lens. There is something exciting about finding something lost, isn't there? And down on our stream at the back here, I one time was leaning over looking at the water and I lost my glasses down there and I never have found them. So one day I'm going to get a team of people in there to comb that. Unfortunately, I think the storm has been through to me. It's probably gone. But if I were to find those glasses, that would be a miracle. I probably won't. But anyway, you're excited about finding something you lost. I get that. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders. That's a pretty picture, isn't it? Graphic. Across his shoulders, back of his shoulders. Object lesson. Okay. From Israel. Yeah, we have it. Yeah. From Israel. That's wonderful. There is the man with the sheep laid across his shoulders. Isn't that touching? Thank you. We didn't plan that. <laughs> That's one of the oldest uh, catacombs. Is it uh, that picture? Of, of a guy with right. hmm. dates to like, the That's second right. century or so. So mm -hmm. well, imagine yourself then, <coughs> Jesus having picked you up, laid him, laid you rather, across his shoulders and is bringing you home, found you, when he comes home, in verse 6, calls together his friends. I like this, socializing. You don't rejoice on your own. Share that joy with other people. Get together with your friends and celebrate. And uh, then, what does it say? When he's found it, lays on his shoulders. When he comes home, calls his friends and his neighbors. Interesting, friends and neighbors. Saying to them, let's have a party. What would be the American? Let's celebrate. What, let's, what, what is the American for that? Nah. Perhaps those words are not ones you want to use publicly. <laughs> Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Is this something to argue about? Is this deep theology where you have to parse the Greek words, heaven forbid? The Bible is supposed to be a simple, realistic book to tell you about life <clears throat> and how to live and about God. But we've turned it into a nightmare, may I say, in terms of what theologians have done with it. If you'll pick up typical book on the Bible. It's about, well, we don't know whether Jesus said this or not. Oh, well, let's discuss how, where was this in, in the ministry? Was it two years in, three? Let's examine every possible question. I'm not romancing here, except the point is, what does it say to you? It's what they call criticism, and that's supposed to be analysis, but it's an awful waste of time, a lot of it, much overrated. 
I think Jesus would object to it as he did in those days, a lot of it. So here we go, rejoice with me, and I tell you then, I love this, I tell you, you can feel the passion in his voice. Let me tell you this now, let's get this straight. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy, I'm tempted to say, more fun in heaven. Can you imagine that? There are heavenly crowds, angels, and God himself, and Jesus, who are, they're having a ball up there. What do they do? I don't know what they do. Do they get their glasses of champagne? Maybe they do. Who cares? They are excited. I love that. God is not a piece of concrete who knew exactly what was going to happen before it happened. There's a certain openness in God. He's taken a risk with us. He's not a Calvinist. God is not a Calvinist. They're rejoicing then in heaven over the one that's lost. Icelandic uh, version, remember? Mm -hmm. Eskimo version. Eskimo yeah. version. What was it? There will be more tail wagging in heaven <laughs> because that's the only joy that they know. <laughs> the more yeah. tail wagging, right? That's lovely. <laughs> Anyway, more tail wagging in heaven. Can I comment on verse 7? Yes. Uh, recently, or maybe, we get a lot of uh, questions regarding uh, repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, people have a concept out there, I don't know why, but yeah. that a Christian is supposed to forgive unconditionally. Yeah. And it's interesting yeah. that if you look at our relationship with God, there's no salvation without repentance. No, that's right. Everyone has to repent. And the comment I want to make is regarding how we should, how do, do how does that relate to Christians mm -hmm. versus Christian forgiveness? If a brother or sister offends you or sins against you, you know, uh, Luke 17, 1 comes to mind. Yeah. It says, uh, rebuke them. I'll just put it on the screen. Mm -hmm. Rebuke them, mm -hmm. it says, and if they repent, yeah. you keep on forgiving infinity right yes. it doesn't say well if your brother or sister and I'm talking about Christians on yes, Christians here, yeah. because we everyone has been wronged yeah. by fellow Christians yeah. so I think people have a concept that and we've gotten questions recently and we've you have tried to address this mm -hmm. in the, in the Q&A that we yeah. believe that according to the biblical standard there needs to be repentance yeah. repentance in order for us to forgive as, right. the, as the ones who have been wronged. Yeah. Well, I think while that repentance is, is waiting to arrive, it doesn't mean that we should hold a grudge against them. That would be the modifying part there. We should have a forgiving attitude ready, but it does say if he forgives. Now people say, well, Jesus said on the cross, forgive them, Father, they don't want to. No, they don't know what they're doing. Yes, but he never ever said they didn't have to repent. They do have to repent. But let's be, for, let's be forgiving in the sense generous minded, not hold a grudge against these people, not want them to be punished, I see that. On the other hand, you can't just say, as some modern counselling does, you're great, you're also great, move on. If an injustice has been committed, that has to be acknowledged, I think. Well, it, it, in the Lucan one that yeah. we'll get to eventually, oh, yes. in a couple of weeks, right. it's interesting because uh, mm -hmm. we're supposed to rebuke each other. Sure. Right, yeah. and and the one who has sinned mm -hmm. against their brother or sister, yeah. by the rebuking, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be struck in the heart, right? Sure. You're supposed to go sure. wake up to yourself, sure. as we say. Sure. But if there is no uh, resolution there, right. right? It doesn't again it doesn't mean you have to hold the grudge, but so. but I cannot forgive that fellow brother and sister, is that, is that correct? Well, it seems to be. The balance falls on that side of the argument, I think, quite definitely does say repeatedly, if he repents, you forgive him. That's very clear. Some of the articles I read on this are very muddled, by the way. They, they wind up saying both things at the same time based on different... It's not, it's not very clear. So that seems to be... But I think we need to handle that with great care, though. We don't go around rebuking everybody all the time for everything they do wrong. That's just chaos. Much less can we excommunicate people. Uh, that's not what we can do. We're not apostles. Now, if somebody's committing adultery, on and on and on and on, coming to your church Sunday by Sunday, that I see we have to draw a line. But we better handle this very, very gently and carefully and certainly not hold any grudges against people. I posted yeah. Barbara's excellent. She did a good plea idea. for a return to biblical repentance. Right. Is forgiveness unconditional question? Yeah. That's a good point. Well, yes. Certainly God requires all of us to repent, and even though Jesus said, forgive them, and you should then, if 
the person who sinned against you innocently, in quotes, didn't know what they were doing. We should have a very forgiving attitude towards them. Yeah, it's a tricky question. Well, not really. It seems to me, <laughs> if he repents, you really forgive clear. him. That's very clear. John 17, not John 17, Luke 17, 3. Luke 17. If he, there's a condition. If he repents, come on, let's not argue about that. Let's accept that now, please. Because people want to argue with everything. But well, I let's think not hold he, any grudges. God knows if a person repents, but people yeah. will, with their fellow man do not necessarily know they if don't, somebody no. repents or not. And I don't know that it's necessary up to us yeah. to be making a judgment well, on whether Well, the problem there is that Jesus says, if he repents, he didn't say, well, if God says he's repenting, if he repents, that's your perception, you have to make the judgment. If he repents, is not, well, if God thinks he's repented, but you don't know. No, if he repents, he's like, look, I'm frankly sorry, look at the parable of the one we're getting to in a moment. What happened to this dear man who went off and got messed up? He came back, but we're going to read it. Right. We'll see whether that man had to repent before God, his father, and God accepted him. So anyway, it's, it's a sensitive issue, but I, I, we must stress the fact that we should not hold grudges against people. That's not doing anything. Well, I think perhaps... See, I'm trying to understand where, where this is coming from, because we might be wrong. I might be wrong in my understanding. But I think you hit, a, you hit a, a nail there with the counselor thing. Because yeah. nowadays, with this sort of counseling, which counseling is is very uh, religious. Yeah. In other words, I don't think there's not many atheist or agnostic counselors out there. I, I think like it's that. a very Christian uh, profession. Sure. And the counseling has, as we know, become very PC, very liberal, and so on. So I'm trying to see where this well, understanding Well, even counselors learn, they get on with their job. But I do think we have to require some repentance before we forgive on that. Anyway, let's leave that alone for the moment. What woman then? Another lost, another losing, finding thing. Let's read verse 8. Whose turn is that? Hmm? Or that woman, or what woman rather, she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, doesn't light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, mm. saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. Yes. I tell you, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Yes, so let's stop right there. Isn't that yeah. He's told the same story twice. This must be frankly important. Uh, there's a text in Timothy where we are operating before God and Jesus and the holy angels. We're being watched by the holy angels and by God, and by Jesus, and they are having fun. They're saying, wow, do you see what he just did? He repented. This is realism. So you want to make God happy, you want to make the angels happy, and Jesus happy. Let them have a party up there in heaven, because we said, my goodness, I was wrong. I've said that in some of my previous religious connections. We were wrong. God can look at our hearts and say, yes, there's certain mitigation because you were ignorant. That's certainly better than being deliberately wrong. But we were wrong. And we caused a lot of havoc. And some of us learn things, which is, it's the, I'm tempted to say, the very devil, get it out of your heads. Because what you learn in a previous association is deeply rooted. At least we can say, my God, I was wrong. However guilty I'm judged to be by God, that's up to him. But we were, were certainly wrong. Okay, good, good point, and we can do more reading on that. See what we want to come up with in mention, addition. Jeff in Australia said he yes. uh, uh, lost a diamond engagement ring oh, in, in, in the dark, oh, really? and they found it. Oh, oh. That's Great. Dark. Wow. You'll have to say Jesus is a good practical teacher, isn't he? Don't you love that? Is this deep theological positive <coughs> Greek words? No, no, no. God is thrilled when we turn around and say, "Thank you for having mercy on me." We were wrong. Okay. Then he said, Jesus, the teacher here. Eleven. Eleven. Who has that? Uh, and he said, a man had two sons. Hmm? Twelve. Twelve. This would be Vicky, right? The younger one said to his father, mm -hmm. Father, give me my inheritance now. Mm -hmm. So the man divided his property between them. Yes. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. Mm -hmm. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Wow. Thank you. That would be me. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, 
and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. He was so hungry that he would have eaten even the pig food, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I am going home to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Yeah. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Okay, did this man re repent? You bet he did. It's interesting how the circumstances came into his life to make it even worse, right? Not only did he squander his inheritance with bad living, but external circumstances just added to the problem. So he was really in dire trouble. But he did not say, well, I really haven't done nothing wrong here. He said, I repent, I'm an idiot, I'm a fool. And God then welcomed him back, which he would not have done if he'd said, well, I, uh, I really haven't done much wrong. That's what I get out of that story. What else do you want to say about that? Anything else in the way of comments? Marvelous. It's moving, isn't it? His moving. repentance was so important. He practiced it. He said, yes. I, I'm going to get up and this is what I'm going to say. Yes. What, what? In verse 18. <laughs> and then in 21, and he comes to him and he says what, what he's rehearsed. So yes. it was important. Yeah, but said, in 20, yeah. the father is, well, he was still a long way off. So the father is there waiting yes. for this repentance. He's, he's not, he doesn't wait for him to come. No, you know, he goes and runs yeah. even while he's a long way away. Yeah. So yeah. He rehearsed his repentance. Yes, he did. Mm. Well, I have noticed. He yeah. planned the words. It's a good observation. Yeah. Yeah. And she makes a good point that the father too was more than willing to forgive when he saw the repentant heart of his son. Well, thank, so you've got both thank sides. God. Well, thank God. Because we're the, sure. you know, where would we be? He, his father felt compassion for him. We should. I, I think, again, we should certainly not hold grudges against people and hope that certainly we shouldn't wish the worst for them while they don't repent. Well, we're That's supposed impossible. to pray for our enemies. Of course so we're supposed to pray for them. Obviously, we can't right. right. Yeah. I was That's trying to find that quotation you found this week where it said that God cannot tolerate any form of falsehood yeah. or falsity in us. Yeah. And that he is so um, happy to go to remember. God it? has a dazzling yes. sense of integrity. This was from the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. I happened to find that quote. God has, it said, a dazzling sense of integrity and will not tolerate for a moment any form of dishonesty. That's in the Bible. I think God's standards are higher than ours, you know. It says that, actually. I hope so. So God is not pleased with dishonesty. There's enough there for us to all wonder about how this works. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. It's an honor to be the child of somebody else. I love the proverb which says, Let the one who bore you rejoice. Be so thrilled about the fact that she bore you, brought you into this world of suffering. Let her be so thrilled about what you're doing. You know, if everybody did that all the time, what kind of a world would we have? You know, the, oh. the, the uh, aspect here that mm -hmm. back, back in the ancient world, uh, inheritance was so paramount, yeah. so essential. You're mm -hmm. talking property, you're talking mm -hmm. housing, right? Mm -hmm. So it went from father to son and so on. But yeah. this inheritance aspect, which is brought that that's the way God uh, makes it a, an example of the kingdom. Absolutely. Is so, has been so devastated with going to heaven. That's true. Because there's no inheritance. No. So I don't have a concept of inheritance anymore, especially in the modern age. Even if we're talking about inheritance of property, sheep and goats and stuff, it's gone in this modern age, you know? So that is so closely tied to the Certainly. kingdom promise and the hope yep. of the Christian. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's very nice to have money, for, and it does say that parents should lay up money for their children. Because that's what it says. Uh, Carlos, should, that goes yeah. along with that wonderful picture and meme you you mm -hmm. uh, put out with us inheriting what Jesus inherits. Yeah, the bride. The bride. Um, yeah, I forgot the word. So yes, what was the word there, Mister? The. Uh, we, oh, we we are. Uh, what was it? We become. 
we marry into oh, we marry into the family. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we marry into Jesus. Jesus. Right, when, when you get married with someone, yes. you're marrying into. He shares his wealth with us. So the worst thing you can say to anybody is, I'm giving the kingdom of God to somebody else. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, to the religious establishment is going to be taken away from you and because you're preventing people from entering the kingdom. Not only do you not enter it yourself, he said to the religious leaders, but you're stopping other people from getting in. And that really made Jesus angry, apparently. Okay, got up. Father had compassion on him, ran, embraced him. I'm surprised that filmmakers, they probably have done this, have not made films out of this. It's very emotional stuff. Imagine the background music at that point, right? Runs and falls on his neck, kisses him. And the son said to him in verse 21, Father, I have sinned. There's the repentance. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Then he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm no longer worthy. So you had better be worthy. Oh no, people say you're not worthy of nothing. That is wrong. You have got to walk, the Bible says, worthy of the kingdom. And it's possible to walk unworthily of the kingdom. In other words, you're not worth the kingdom. Your position in the kingdom is you're not meriting it. There is a sense in which you must be worthy of the kingdom. Otherwise, Jesus would not have said, well done, so-and-so. He didn't say, well done, Jesus, there. We understand that Jesus did all these things for us. That's clear. But the other aspect is equally clear. Well done. You've done well. Yes, you. You've done well. People say, oh, no, if I could just hold the door for a thousand years. Don't say it. Your talent is valuable in God's sight. You have to walk worthy of the kingdom. Yeah, just comment on the, yeah. you used the word grudge. Yes, yeah, grudge, uh, we don't, mustn't hold grudge. shouldn't misinterpret yeah. uh, what, what we're saying about mm -hmm. forgiveness is not unconditional. Yeah, sure. And it's interesting, this example sure. of a father and a son, so yeah. while the son is going, you know, partying, yes. sinning yeah. his life away, yeah. I'm sure the father wasn't holding a grudge back home. Uh, a normal parent would be crying there. Sure. Every, like Absolutely. my mother with my brother. Yes. Who's unfortunately very bad. In a bad again. condition, right. She cries herself to sleep every night. It, yeah. It's so hurtful Absolutely. that she says to me. Absolutely. Uh, mm. You know, it's, it's tough. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. So it's a good example yep. of not holding a grudge. Oh, yeah. It's not about holding grudges. No, no. Yeah. It's about. But there has to be repentance. My brother has to repent. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, there's, there's all sorts of uh, powerful lessons as you meditate on all this. How does it affect you and your life? Okay, let's move on. The father said to the slaves, 22, bring the best robe. I like that because this is in the kingdom. You get clothed in, you get clothed in righteousness now. And in the kingdom, you will undoubtedly have some very special clothing. Put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf. That's come into our language, isn't it? The fattened calf. I'm reading this to move on quickly here. Kill it, let us eat and celebrate. For well, this, my son was dead, spiritually dead, but has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Nothing wrong with celebration. I love that. Nothing wrong with celebration. Fat and calf. Let's eat and drink. And there are texts in Deuteronomy 14 which say, Go to the feast and have your strong drink and your wine. My Baptist friends out there, I hope they are listening to that very carefully. Go there and celebrate and be normal and rejoice because that's what Jesus did and what God does too. So watch out for my. The expression was dead. That means spiritually dead, right? We get in a huge muddle in Revelation 20. We have people who are dead who come to life. But in that case, they were people who had had their heads chopped off. That's not spiritually dead. That means literally dead. So people get in a big muddle about dead. Well, there you go. Dead means spiritually dead. Sometimes it does. And other times it clearly doesn't. Here, spiritually dead is right. <coughs> okay, 25. <coughs> Excuse me, who is that? Who has that verse for us? Uh, me. Okay, pretty Now his older son was in the field, <coughs> mm -hmm. and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. Wow. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. He replied, Your brother is back, and your father has killed the fattened cat, because he has come home safe and sound. Yes. But he became angry and was no 
not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. Um, but he replied, <coughs> all, all these years I've worked hard for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Hmm. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. <coughs> mm -hmm. But we should be happy and celebrate. This is your brother who was dead, but who has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Yes, interesting. I think the father wasn't as repentant as he might be there. I think he rather justifies himself, doesn't he? <laughs> he doesn't quite respond if there's truth in what the other son said. I didn't get much from you, Dad, or I was doing well. Note what a son is supposed to do. I've always done what you told me to do. Okay, I remind you, what is a son or a daughter supposed to do? First, obey mom and dad. Obey, obey, obey. Do what they tell you to do. Secondly, to watch mom and dad and copy them. Learn the trade. And thirdly, go out and represent mom and dad for all the good principles they taught you. So three things. Obedience, copying, imitation, and learning the trade. Those are what children are supposed to do. And then, as the command says, they will have a long life on the earth, in the land. For quoting that from the Old Testament. You get a long life in the land. Nothing about going to heaven. So... That's very clear to me. It struck me as I read that, though, that the father might have been a bit more generous about the criticism that the second son brought to him. But, you know, that's speculation. What else can we say? All that is mine is yours. So the dad is generous. Jesus then shares his kingdom with us. We are co-heirs. The father's sharing his world with us. He wants to give you the world, Jeremiah 27, 5. He wants to give it to you. The whole thing, he made it for you, gave it to Jesus, and Jesus wants to share it with us. It's a marvelous story, isn't it? All of which I think has been killed into nonsense by the idea that when you die, you go to heaven. That's just frightfully disappointing. Makes nonsense of the plot line, the narrative, as they say, and the uh, sequence of events that makes God's plan so reasonable when you understand it. Any comments out there? I didn't think there need to be. Self-evident. Um, I guess it's um, back to the <coughs> My mom wanted Carlos to read Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Okay. And I asked him, do you, is he referring that in reference to or talking about repentance? Mm -hmm. And then he said that, yes, we should not look down on anything that one has offended us, but the person is no longer our brother or sister. Yeah. Since they did not repent, mm -hmm. we are not responsible to forgive them. Right. That's true. He's reading a parallel passage to Luke 17, 3. In Matthew 18, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault. I don't think this is every little tiny detail. Heaven forbid that we should be so critical of everybody all the time. This is a major, a major, major problem. Right. There's some just, real, but not, well, I don't like this size of your, whatever, your shoes or your ears, the length of your head. Well, somebody this, makes you mad about something. Yes. Whatever. And so, it's a oh, serious you repent to God, therefore I don't, I mean, that is just get, can get a That's, little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely right. But it's, it's he must mean in some very strong sense. Go and show him his fault in private, if he listens to you, I'm reading from Matthew 18, if he listens to you, there's a condition, you've won your brother. But if he doesn't repent and listen to you, it obviously implies repentance, then you take some more people along and try to make your case with two or three witnesses. That every fact may be confirmed. Facts are very important. God is not waffly with facts. Okay. If he refuses to listen to them, in other words, if he doesn't repent, then you have to tell the church. You have to warn the church. Paul says that clearly. Mark those who are causing divisions and have nothing to do with them. Wow. It's very hard for us to operate that now. We must do it with extreme caution. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth and so on, the rest is clear. But that is tough. Jesus is not a vague, you're great, you're great, big hug, move on. It's not that style. It's honest and facing tough love. Yeah, tough love. In some sense. 
Okay, that takes us to the end of the 15th chapter. Then we're getting into the 16th chapter. Time to do a little bit more. 16.1. Now he was also saying to the disciples, his students, that is, there was a rich man who had a manager. Same topic. And this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. Dishonest in other words, yes. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. Mm -hmm. The manager said to himself, Now, what am I going to do since mm -hmm. my master is firing me from my job as manager? Mm -hmm. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. <laughs> I know what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, quickly. <laughs> so when I'm removed from the management, people will welcome me into their home. Oh, yes. So he invited all those who were in debt to his master yeah. to come and see him. Yeah. He asked the first one, how much do you owe my master? Yeah. The man replied, 800 gallons of olive oil. Yes. Okay. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, 100 measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eight. Mm -hmm. And his master eight. eight. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal mm -hmm. for being so shrewd. Mm -hmm. And it is true that the citizens of this world are more shrewd mm -hmm. than the godly are. Okay, let's uh, comment on that verse before we go any further. The eighth verse. And his master <laughs> praised him, his lord praised him, praised the unrighteous manager, the dishonest one, because he'd acted shrewdly, not in fact, but according to the world's standards, obviously, for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own yenea, their own generation, please note the word, their own generation. That word <coughs> generation will come up in our prophecy conference in Arkansas shortly. Generation doesn't just mean 40 years or 70 years. They're more shrewd than the people of their same brood, right? Their same tendency, their same evil tendency. That's true. People in the world, not the Christians, are clever, cleverer with their dealings than are the people of this age. Uh, uh, sorry. They are cleverer than the people of Jesus' brood. Got it right now. Jesus' yenia, Jesus' society, his brood of people, his type of people, are not as smart sometimes in their financial dealings as are the people of this age in relation to people of their own kind. You see, that's what yenia means. People of the same kind. It's nothing to do with 40 years or anything like that. Then the sons of light. Sons of light are the Christians. You find that at Qumran, they know who the sons of light are, the good people. The sons who are enlightened. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. Those who see the light of the gospel of the kingdom. Now, let me tell you then, go ahead, make friends for yourself by means of the wealth of unrighteousness that when it fails, it will receive you or they will receive you into eternal dwelling. I think that's sheer, sheer irony. It's, he's being sarcastic there. Mm. Go ahead then, use your money crookedly to make friends with people crookedly and let the money then usher you into the kingdom of God. Ha, ha, ha. I, I think that's probably what most commentators would say. Jesus is using irony there, cynicism, right. Try using your money to get your head and you'll find out, you won't find out in fact, but you may imagine wrongly that money is going to get you into the kingdom, it won't. I think it'll help, like commentators mm -hmm. say, to stop at uh, halfway through verse 8. Yep. Uh, that's the end of the parable and then Jesus sort of makes his commentary. Oh, yes. This is the children of this age because the verse break here doesn't help, you know what I mean? Verse 8, mm -hmm. uh, the parable sounds like it ends uh, mm -hmm. before Jesus says the children of this age. Yes. Time, so okay. Yeah, I think, I think the sense is, is, is fairly clear. He's, he must not be talking then uh, quite literally. It's Jesus' commentary about the parable is saying, I think, and people take that mm -hmm. sometimes as yeah, he's not, he's not inviting us to use wealth in the way that crooked people do it. Right, right. Try that and you'll see how far it'll get you. You won't get into the kingdom. 16. He who is faithful in a very little thing... 
10, sorry, ten. not 16, 10. He was faithful in a very little thing, is faithful also in much. Did you do that? Did I? Yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the sarcastic yeah. one. I, uh, let me tell you this. Go ahead, make friends for yourself by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, the money, they will receive you into eternal dwelling. Now, you could go two ways with that. You could take that as a serious piece of teaching. You can also take it as a piece of sarcasm. I don't know which way. You could look at that. Look the up note the comment. in your translation mm -hmm. says, Jesus is speaking with irony here, right, okay. since money will never achieve a place in the coming kingdom. Yes, the that's come. the way I took it. That may be wrong. You may want to revise that. Uh, one would have to compass the various commentators and see what they do. I think yeah, that's probably irony. Does anybody have this in some other easier to understand translation? Yes. What have you got in your in LT there, Robert? Verse 10. Uh, I tell you, mm -hmm. use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Okay, that's taking it in a different sense. Yes. Oh, that's use your worldly to benefit, and, and mm -hmm. then this will help you into the kingdom. That's a different sense. Okay, it's great. We have a question there. We can ask, we can work at that. Take it both ways. There's a truth involved, I think, in both ways. Money used dishonestly will not get you into the kingdom. On the other hand, money used honestly can benefit you. Either way. Well, it's a little question. Fine. Why not? Then he does say in 16 something which is not at all ironic, not at all cynical. If you're faithful in a very little thing, you're faithful in much. If you're unrighteous in a little thing, you're unrighteous also in much. That's very true, isn't it? If, you're, if your attitude is sloppy in one area, you're likely to be sloppy in other areas. That's worth thinking about as is all the teaching of Jesus. Therefore, in 11, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, well, the lesson here is you better be very careful in the use of money. You don't squander your money by giving it irresponsibly. On the other hand, you don't become so tight-fisted, you don't help out some when they're in trouble. That recalls, that, uh, recalls what Bob talk, talked about last week, the issue of giving. It requires careful judgment. He was unrighteous in a very little thing. Love that. If you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, mammon, who will entrust you with the true riches of the kingdom? I've got it. That part I see. Anything to be said well, about that? Well, my margin has mm -hmm. mammon, 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 yes. mammon, mammon, yes. signifying riches, wealth, etc., yes. personified as an object of worship. Yes. Good point. That even adds a different meaning to the Yeah, I think the idea is, is clear though. If you're, if you're getting the wrong concept of money, if you're worshipping it, it's not going to get you anywhere. On the other hand, you better use it faithfully and carefully, otherwise you won't be given the riches of the kingdom. Lots of lessons there. Okay. It's just some weird word. Being faithful is a good thing. Yes. Faithful, faithful in the use, mm -hmm. use of unrighteous wealth. Yes. Well, Mamona, yes, it, it can be unrighteous wealth. Not all wealth is unrighteous. I know, that's why I'm trying to understand it. But my, yeah. my verse says that, so that's why I'm trying to understand what it means. Yeah, I, I think they've, they've taken it one way rather than the other there. Again, these are details that we could study further in the commentaries. I would descend on my own commentaries. Not easy for people to do that. You have a seminary library close to you. You go there and sign up for a day or so, get a membership, and you can pour over that if you want further detail. We can try different translations. As we saw, the NLT gets a different sense than the NASV there. Anyway, I think the general idea is clear, isn't it? We should be faithful in the use of finances. But don't imagine that money will get you into the kingdom, something like that. Then uh, the point there that I think we missed... 12 is earlier, a little bit better. 12 is getting easy. Just before we get, get to that later point, the story about the person who forgave is obviously then tied in with the earlier stories of forgiveness, is it not? Is not is it here or is it another gospel where the man who was forgiven refused to forgive others, right? That's it. In, the, in this gospel or maybe in Matthew. Most important, a greater lesson which is very clear is having been forgiven, then we have to be willing to forgive others, which is exactly what the man in the parable Matthew six. That's Matthew. If you, know? you thought, if you do not forgive other well, that too. Mm -hmm. Your father will not. Yeah, you. there's a story, another parable, where a man is forgiven, then he goes out and beats the people who owe him money. 
It says, here I've forgotten what it is, but that's very clear. He's not as forgiving to others as God was forgiving to him. That's easy. <coughs> Let's move on for the moment. Okay, 12. Who's going to read 12? Oh, is it 13? Uh, 12. Yeah. And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, yes. who will give you that which is your own? No servant can obey two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And money, and unrighteous mammon. Yeah, mam mam mammona is taken to be a bad thing. Yeah, I think it's fairly clear, isn't it? Fourteen. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, ah. were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. Yes. But Jesus said to them, You appear pious to people, but God knows your heart. What what people value highly is detested by God. Yes. Okay, stop there a moment. Mm -hmm. He said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God can look with his x-ray eyes on your heart, knows exactly what your intentions are. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. That has a whole range of preaching possibilities. Dare we mention the fact that some babies have been murdered this morning to the tune of several thousand, which in the eyes of some is wonderful freedom and choice, and the eyes of others might be an abominable, his so unspeakable, the wrath of God is about to fall on us. So, Depends on your point of view, but there's a huge principle there. God detests. Now, God does hate things. Somebody sent me an email this week. Remember Patrick Donahue, I think, who was a friend of ours. And he listed all the texts in which he says that God hates even people. Yes, he wants them to come to repentance. I see that. But he hates what they're doing. He detests it. He can't stand some things. And that's why his wrath finally breaks loose. And he decimates most of the world, apparently. I thought he was hate the sin, not the sinner. Uh, that's what they say, but actually the text says he hates those people in the psalm. But uh, you know, I don't want to overdo that. But God is not a sort of a well-meaning, easy-going smile at anything we do. He hates certain things, and he detests them. They're abominable. Take the thing in the Proverbs. If you bless what is right, you're doing good. If you bless what is wrong, you are an abominable thing. If you curse what is right, you're an abomination. Those are very strong words. What I'm getting from this is that God is not mealy-mouthed. His sense of right and wrong has a dazzling integrity about it. He's fearfully intolerant of sin. He's not keen on babies born out of wedlock. Not keen is to put it in a stupid British understatement. Not keen on it. He's going to see those people don't survive. So we have to be very fierce on sin, if God is. I see that and yet very forgiving when people are turning in repentance. Hard to be like God, isn't it? Hard to get that balance. Challenging. Okay, then 16, what about that? The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Mm -hmm. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, mm -hmm. and everyone is forcing his way into it. Yeah, it's a difficult text. There's one much discussed exactly what does he mean in the second half there. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John the Baptist came along, and you'll find in Matthew 3, 1, that John the Baptist proclaimed the kingdom. So it appears that at the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God was being proclaimed, as with John, and everyone is forcing his way into it. it may also mean it's, it's difficult in the Greek there. Some people are attacking it. Some of the translations give you that sense. Others, people are forcing their way into it rightly. It's either a good thing or a bad thing. Doesn't matter, you can take it both ways. I've seen um, yes. uh, this translation mm -hmm. uh, has the law and the prophets yeah. were in force yes. until John yes. the Baptist. Yes. Is that a good yes. anti Sabbath? Yes. Anti yes, the law and the prophets, in, you always have to say in the letter. Evolution. In the letter of the law, the spirit of the law continues. The letter of the law, namely physical circumcision for everybody, including Gentiles was certainly in force until John the Baptist began the new era of preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So it sounds like he's yeah. alluding to what's yes. the new The way law. to say that to your friends is, I believe passionately in the law, in the spirit, not in the letter. We get these emails all the time. Why, Anthony, aren't you proclaiming the law? Because Jesus said, not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. He did. 
but he must mean the law in the spirit otherwise you're going to have to insist that everybody gets physically circumcised if you insist on that as some do then Paul is a grand false prophet you, have, you make your choice you always start with the, the physical circumcision issue Genesis 17 where clearly everybody who wants to be in the covenant including a Gentile must be male if he's male circumcised he has to be he cannot period be Paul obviously says the opposite Paul says if you get circumcised don't go there then you will be obliged to keep the whole law don't imagine it right that's obviously not the same thing the only way I can process that is by saying that Paul is doing a new thing in the spirit so you can say I don't believe in the letter of the law otherwise you better be keeping the new moons scrupulously you better be doing it so I don't believe in the letter of the law but the spirit of the law absolutely yes of course uh, this also has an interesting mm -hmm. interpretation of this difficult yeah. force in yeah, yes, that one. because of the grammatical construction yes, right, they right, say right, right. they translate it as and everyone is urged to enter yes. into it's right. it, it's the, the right. kingdom it is. either that is being urged yes, yeah, right. instead of forcing it's, it which yeah. But it's, it's interesting, yeah, it makes more sense to yeah. me than maybe. It's an ambiguity. There is in all language, there are some things which are ambiguous. You can't go back and ask Jesus, what did you mean exactly? So take it both ways. There's truth involved <laughs> in both ways. Well, when it says for, everyone is forcing his way yes. into it, that doesn't sound like you're being forced by somebody else. It sounds like you're trying. Right. So in other words, you're, you're trying to get there. Right. Absolutely. You're working. Yeah. It is ambiguous. There are various ways you might take the Greek, unfortunately, which is fine, but this is a, true of a very few verses. Could be men were crowding to enter the kingdom. Yes. My notes. That right. you know. That's a Could positive thing. Positive. But, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Anyway, but it's easier, now notice this, for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Now he's not there talking about the letter of the law as opposed to the spirit of the law, otherwise it would be in total confusion. But every jot and tittle of the law has to be fulfilled. In the spirit, that is. If that's not so, then you must insist on everybody being physically circumcised. That's what the law says. You must insist on them keeping the new moons, because that's what you said you must do. You certainly must ins insist on keeping the Sabbath on Saturday, because that's what the law says. You must insist on the feast days, because that's what the law clearly says. So what does Jesus mean? In view of what Paul said later, he must mean in the spirit of the law. So that's the broad principle you use in teaching others at this point. And then you say, having said that, there is this attitude of Paul as well. That he's very willing to please other people if it's for the sake of the gospel. For example, he said, Timothy, he circumcised. Paul circumcised Timothy, whose father was not a Jew and his mother was and it then says he circumcised Timothy because of the Jews not because that's what you have to do to be a Christian the most important Paul actually shaved his head went and did some vowing uh, apparatus in the, in the temple wonderful does that mean we all have to do it now of course not there's no temple anyway so there is the principle of what would you call it um, something like British diplomacy American diplomacy too <laughs> good diplomacy Listen, if you're keeping the Sabbath, I'm going to keep it with you. Of course. Does that mean I'm going to let you teach my whole church to keep it? No way. So there's that element then of what is profitable and useful at the time as distinct from what is required of everybody in the church. The most important distinction. And Paul says that. I'm not under the law myself. Most carefully, most carefully. 1 Corinthians 9.21. This is a massive subject right there. Paul says, I, Paul, am not under the law. <clears throat> that's clear I'm not under the law I'm not under the law of Moses in the letter however I am entorahed to Christ I'm under the Torah of Christ it's a verb I'm entorahed if you can imagine that E-N-T-O-R-A-H-E-D I'm entorahed to Messiah another law so the law of Messiah is not the law of Moses in the letter I get that unfortunately this is still plaguing a lot of folk who attack us sometimes quite mercilessly because we're not insisting on Sabbath keeping. Anyway, big subject. Um, there's something out there, I don't know if everybody knows, it's called the BibleProject.org okay. Org. Is it okay. And it's, it, it's this thing that I'm reading through, you mm. know, in the Old Testament, sure. and, and that's all right, I'm, sure. I'm sure it's the whole Bible, but, sure, sure. but they give you these little uh, videos, mm -hmm. we kind of heard about it through Sean, um, okay. Finnegan, 
Okay. And they give you these little videos, like at the beginning of each book of yeah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Yeah. They kind of help you understand what is going on here, mm -hmm. especially with all those sacrifices. Yeah. And it really has helped me understand that a lot of the sacrifices they had to do were there was you know there were sacrifices of thanksgiving yeah. because the people we even now should be thankful Absolutely. we should be there were thank, there were sacrifices for cleanliness for mm -hmm. uh, holiness mm -hmm. and all the different things that these sacrifices were about were so that the people would be holy clean pure Absolutely. set apart have a contrite heart you know draw themselves to god mm -hmm. And and live you know godly holy lives, mm. and so they had to do that by killing animals and sacrificing things and doing that to be reminded daily of these things. Absolutely. Whereas we now have all that in a spirit yes. form. So when it says that the law is not going to be, you know, it's going to still point. be enforced. It is enforced within us. And we just don't have to do all that stuff. Right. That's and of it's we a great have point. The spirit which yep. they didn't have. Right. The spirit to help us. That's right. That. Yeah, that's very good. I mean, I think the easy way of putting it is that Paul is doing this, the law in the spirit, and so is Jesus, really. Not as clearly as Paul. He does, he, he, Paul advances with Jesus' approval to make it even clearer, but Jesus is doing the spirit of the law too. Classic example is this. Moses said, you can have a divorce for whatever reason. It's not even clear what the reasons are, but for various reasons you can have a divorce. And Jesus said, wait a minute. I didn't say that. God didn't say it. Not he, Jesus, he wasn't there at the creation. But God said something different at the beginning. So you see what Jesus has done there? He's overruled Moses. Moses is not what you do now. Because they said, can we have a divorce for any and every reason? doesn't matter what those reasons were. There were m massive number of reasons that Moses allowed for. And he said then, because of the hardness of your heart, Jesus said, Moses allowed you to get divorced for this and that other reason. Well, we're about to read that. We're going to read that. Yeah. Are we? Next, Next verse. verse. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Without the exception, then. Right. Without any exception. Okay. Good. Eighteen. Yep. Eighteen. This one then simply makes the broad <coughs> principle: if you divorce your wife, marry another, you're committing adultery, and vice versa. That sounds then as if there is no exception. <laughs> this would lead us then to a very difficult position: that if you Married to somebody else during the life of your first spouse, you are living in adultery and you better quit right now. If that's all we had, that's what we would have to do. However, we have Matthew reporting the words of Jesus in more detail. And then the best we can do with this would be to say that the exception is to be read in from Matthew into this. Otherwise, we've got sheer contradiction. We either go with sheer contradiction or we have to say in Matthew 19:28, this is a question that's asked a lot. Uh, not 28, Matthew 19th chapter, there are exceptions. Jesus said the Moses exceptions are gone. But you've got people out there on the internet saying, well, we're just as hard-hearted as the people of Moses, so we can do whatever, Mo we've got examples of this, and we've had to say, stop it. If you're going to get divorced for no good reason, then you're living in adultery. This puts a challenging... Uh, a challenging, what would the word be? Forcing into judgment by other Christians. We are not exempt from this. We are going to have to judge. If you're going to approve somebody living in adultery, you are guilty of that too. We must stand up for Jesus at all costs. I see. Okay, so this would have to be then, the passage we're about to, to read here, would have to be modified by what we read in Matthew. Here's the simple story. Again, these, these questions are coming out as daily, so I, I, I'm not ashamed to suggest what we might do. Jesus does give one exception. He gives an exception. If you have adulterous relationships, ongoing, unrepented, unceasing, that breaks a marriage. That's the end of it. Then you are divorced. Please note, people don't understand this. Jesus was not asked about separation. He was not, not, not asked about separation. That's a different thing. He was asked about divorce. This is the way to explain it to your friends. The question was not, can we have a separation for every reason? No, no. Can we have a divorce? Listen, when you're divorced, you're not married. Is it clear? This would save a lot of agony out there. And Jesus said, you cannot get divorced on the basis of Moses, where he said, for this and that, whatever it was, it doesn't matter exactly. That's no longer, because he allowed that for the hardness of your heart, and guess what? You are not to be hard-hearted. Is that clear? It's utterly clear. So, there is half an exception. He said, and I'm not telling you, Jesus did. 
that, that unless there is fornication involved, which is broad sexual impurity, broad term, if there is unrepented sexual immorality in the marriage, then that creates a divorce. You can have a divorce for that. Guess what? When you're divorced, you're not married. Is it clear? Then you're right. You have a right, if you choose, to marry within the faith, of course, to somebody else. I'm, I'm only mentioning that because it does get asked a lot. Otherwise, we would be in the law courts, believe me. If we believed that every second marriage was adultery, if your spouse is alive, and we preached that, very soon we'd be in the law courts. Because people say, wait a minute, the un person is not coming to church. They say, what's this guy doing? He's telling my wife to get it. We don't have to do that. Thank the Lord. You take people where they are, they come to church, they may be in the 15th marriage. Okay, let's go from there. Let's not trace back all, all this. See, that's just wrong. I'm talking from the heart here, folks, because in a previous association, we had whole droves of people needing special ministry. That's awfully bad. So I think we've, I hope we've got a balance in that one. Okay. 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 Yes. The <laughs> exception you mentioned of infidelity yes. apparently covers things like desertion. Yes. It that's has important. To. It's very important to say that. Now, I didn't mention the other exception. That's in Paul. Jesus, speaking in Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10, says that if an unbeliever in a, in a marriage partner, you've got a mixed marriage, if an unbeliever leaves, then the other one, the believer, is not bound to chase that person around the room and then try to keep the marriage together. It's clear you're deserting. Now, desertion would apply if you're being beaten, for instance, in a marriage. I, I want to say this because it's massively something that people want to know about, you obviously are being deserted. You cannot say that your husband who comes and beats you every night is a drunkard, he's deserted you. Clearly, you have a right, I think, to divorce at that point. And then, if you're divorced, you have a right to rematch. However, if you're getting divorced for no reason at all, for no good cause, for burning the toast, watch out, you might just be walking right into adultery. So, we've got to get a balance on that. Now, if we've got all this wrong, I hope God will show us. I think that's the best we can do. What I said there is more or less a standard evangelical view, by the way. So, just right. to be clear on the look one, so yeah. if, we, if we accept the yeah. harmonization... Yes, to, well, I do accept, accept I have to. ...what Matthew has to yes. say. Uh, so, in this example, mm -hmm. the person commits adultery because the the one who divorced wrongfully, let's call it, yeah. uh, taints them with adultery, as it were, you know what I mean? So, if we follow the, the Matthew line... I said, not, uh, it, it, Jesus stopped a man, he said, well, what's this if? <laughs> Remember? If we, we, we do, we accept Matthew, right. we accept Luke, there's so, no ifs here, we accept both. Harmonizing them would mean that the Matthew one gives more detail than the... Right, so the, the person who divorces for the wrong reason, yes, right? committing and, and marries another yes. person, the other person, which at that point yes. is innocent, yes. is brought in into the adulterous yeah, relationship. It's an adulterous relationship. So, it's gone wrong. So yeah. Jesus, in this example, mm -hmm. without this qualification, mm -hmm. would say, what would he say to that newly married couple that is in adultery, basically? Well, you have to say, they're in, if, they're, if they're remarried for the wrong reason, if they're divorced for the wrong reason, then that's an adulterous relationship. Right. Well, he would tell them straight and to their Jesus face. would say, of course. repent of course. and say no more, right? Of course. He wouldn't break it up. So is that what you're suggesting? No, no, no. It gets too complicated. Uh, <laughs> second, third marriage and all that. No, he would I think he would say, let's go from where you are and move on. Right. Otherwise, so he would tell this, this person who has, has committed adultery yeah. in this new marriage, yeah. say, look, this is how it is. Yeah. Hopefully the per the couple or the person yeah. repents, yeah. and and that's that's a new marriage yeah. in God's eyes. You, you well, yeah, I don't go there. I don't. No? I don't even get involved. In it. I, I I think really? it's just too difficult. You have to stay yeah, with where you sure. are. Judgments. You cannot be breaking up. I think, except in the community. If you've got full bona fide believers, baptized members, right, then the rules for them are are very clear. If you have believing partners. They have no right to rematch. You're a believer. You're a believer. There's no right to rematch. However, if one of those people become an unbeliever, supposing they cease to be a believer and they go off and commit adultery or whatever, that's a different situation. They're no longer believers. But it's not that hard. What we do in the fifth, sixth, seventh marriage, you know, that's that's we have to start from where we are.
I don't think it's difficult, provided we don't set one gospel against the other, and that's what we're trying not to do. Okay, uh, where were we? Let's just finish this chapter. 19. 19. All right, now we're into the parable of Lazarus. Right, this gives more trouble out there than perhaps any other passage of Scripture. We're going to be told by some that maybe we should wait. Would you rather wait till, wait till next, week? next week? Why don't we do that? Yeah, it's a long one. Let's do that next week. So please read that carefully and plan in your mind what are you going to say to your friends who say, there you go, we all go to heaven when we die, or we all go to hell when we die. That's clear from this story. That's it. Never mind the rest of Scripture. So what are you going to do to deal with that? Okay, appreciate your patience out there with some of this material. So Jesus is controversial, obviously. You're yeah. away next week, I think? Uh, yes, that's true. So somebody else, um, maybe Carlos or Bob or somebody, will be standing in. We are at a prophecy conference in Arkansas. Get to talk about the Great Tribulation and talk about the abomination of desolation. Happy subjects. Not really. Uh, next week, that will be fun. I do appreciate everybody listening out there. It's a great honor to have you with us. And your interaction, your comments are always valuable. So keep the faith, and we'll uh, see you again. <laughs> two months from today yes. is the conference. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding me of that, right? Our 25th annual conference will be on the 28th of April. You can sign up at which website is it called again? Theological, Theological Conference. Conference. Uh, or, or. This is a gathering of Bible believing, keen, earnest Christians. It's not some learned thing that only quote scholars, whoever they are, should come to. It's a Bible meeting and you'll make a lot of very special friends, some even coming from Switzerland. So please come along and welcome those people and be blessed as well as being a blessing yourself as you tell your faith.